بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد ومن ولا So we begin with the name of God, the most gracious, the merciful. We beseech him, we ask him to send his peace and blessings upon our beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Before I start, I would just like us to give a round of applause for our interpreters who are doing a great job, right? Give us some love. And also our brothers and sisters here, we want to welcome you. Um, I've worked with Global Deaf Muslims in the past, and I think it's an organization that we really need to be, like those are the little things that matter, you know, that we tend to, well actually the big things that matter, that we tend to ignore. So I've been asked to talk about the subtle roof. What is your problem, bro? First of all, you like hate on me in the introduction, and now, why are you getting this piece of paper? I'm not gonna at, tell people you're single, okay? Just stop, dude. <laughs> Dang, dude. Gosh, bro, it's like Armani suit. Okay, fine, I get it. It's like, just relax, man. You put that on layaway, man. I know what's up, dude. You see that? That's called vengeance. So I've been asked to talk about the subtle reformer. The Prophet says on him as a subtle reformer. Now. Before we start, you might want to be able to, to write some things down because you're going to need to write some points down. Um, one of the problems I have with, with conferences in general, what I like about ICANN in particular, it doesn't have this feel. It becomes just like an entertainment kind of session where your favorite bands play their songs, you get high, you go home, then Game of Thrones is on Sunday night, and you're trying to make khalas from Khaleesi, and you ain't doing it, right? Whereas what needs to happen is more like edutainment, you know, where you learn and you're entertained, right? There's an aspect of entertainment, but then most importantly, there, there needs to be things we take home with us that help us build on our acumen of Islamic literacy. So when we're talking about reform and the prophet as a subtle reformer. This brings to mind an incredible book that uh, is written in the Maliki Medhab which actually is four volumes by a scholar named Al-Qarafi. And Al-Qarafi, if you're from Egypt, he was from the Qaraf. And Imam Al-Qarafi, in his book, he talks about the different roles of the Prophet, like the different roles the Prophet played. So the Prophet as a judge, the Prophet as a sheikh, the Prophet as a general, the Prophet as a teacher, and so on and so forth. And then he says that if someone were to take these qualities, and, and put them out of context. So if I were to be a judge, when I'm supposed to be a sheikh, or a sheikh when I'm supposed to be a husband, he said that person would actually be contradicting the sunnah. So one of the 22 or 23 different roles the prophet plays is muslih, is the reformer. Yuslih, bayna nas. And the word reform in Arabic means to take something that was facid to make it salih to take something that was corrupted and make it better. Now in his role as a reformer, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was sometimes subtle and sometimes he was blunt, depending on the situation. So what I wanna do is talk about as an individual, what are the qualities that you and I would need to have to be reformers, those who correct what's wrong around them, understanding that there's great rewards for that, and we find seven qualities mentioned in the Quran. Now these are individual attributes that you should try to achieve. And at the end, I'll talk about a few policy pieces like what should be kind of the ethos of reform? What are some of the principles that guide reform? First of all, Allah says in the Quran, Allah mentions the first quality that we should all try to acquire if we want to be involved in prophetic reform in order to be subtle or wise, in Surah Yusuf, the 12th chapter of the Quran, Allah says, say this is my way, I invite upon Basira. Basira. Basira means insight. There was a great Imam, Raghab al-Asfahani, he wrote a dictionary just on words of the Quran, he was from Asfahan, Iran, 
who is a great Shafi'i scholar. He said that Basira means Yudrik al Ta'if, that someone is able to understand the subtleties of things. So it's different than knowledge. That's why we say Basira akhassu min al ilm. We say that Basira, insight, is more specific than just knowledge. The ability to understand particular things, right? So you might know that Ravi Kebab has the best chicken cry in the DMV. That's knowledge. But if you were to know the ingredients, that will be Basira. See that? It's kind of cool. So in order to be someone engaged in da'wah, I have to have basira. And Imam Ibn Qayyim said, basira are two things. It's two things. Number one is knowledge of the issue. So I have to make sure like what I'm talking about, I have the prerequisite knowledge to engage in that subject. So is this type of financial agreement halal or haram or whatever? If you don't know, you shouldn't jump into that, right? Allah said in the Quran, don't get into things you don't know about. One of the things that shaitan tries to encourage us to do is to speak about Allah in things that we don't know. Nowadays we see everybody saying haram, haram, haram. Imagine Imam Malik, Imam Malik, he was shy to say haram. And all of us in this conference, if we took all of the knowledge that we had collectively and put it in one brain, it would not be a drop of the knowledge of Malik. But still Imam Malik is like, I'm scared to say haram. It's with Allah. So knowledge of the issue at hand. So for example, you walk into the restroom and you see someone making wudu with Red Bull. And they're like, I want to be really, really pumped up for the salah, man. <laughs> right? Your first inclination is going to be, that's wrong. And it is wrong, okay? But you have to make sure the hadith of Abu Umama al-Bahili, radiallahu anhu, that you know why you're saying that. You have some basic knowledge, okay? If you see someone praying different than you, you shouldn't correct them unless you know for sure that how they're praying is wrong, not an assumption. So that's knowledge of the situation. The second aspect of knowledge is knowledge of the cultural context which you live in. So Ibn Qayyim said, ilmu deen wa ilmu a'raf. Knowledge of the religion and knowledge of the culture. Knowledge of the people that you're speaking to. This was so important that a great, again, Al-Qarafi, Al-Maliki, he said, he wrote a book about the etiquettes of fatwa. I studied it when I was studying to be a mufti. And in that book he said, وَلَا يَجُوزُ mufti and yufti." It's not allowed for someone to give a fatwa to people he doesn't understand their slang. She doesn't understand their slang. Because you might misunderstand things and you might say it wrong. So maybe the word that they use in their slang is different than the word how you use it in your slang and you find yourself in trouble. And he said, in fact, whoever does that should have their legal license suspended. You have to understand the cultural context of the people. Look at the end of the Quran. The Quran speaks to the culture of the Arabs and it also speaks to universal culture. The last third of the Quran, which all of you memorized, actually contains every aspect of a society. Number one are popular culture issues like Game of Thrones, Pretty Little Liars, I don't know all these shows, right? The Cleveland Cavaliers, fanboys, you know, people who like a team. See, you can head on Paul Pierce, but let me say something real quick. Hold on, Just pause, pause for a minute. Where are you from? New York. You're from New York. <laughs> Let's just continue. So, um, certain things you just don't need to address, you know, because it's so self evident, you know. Right. I love you, bro. The draft is coming. The draft is coming. Allah help you with Carmelo. <laughs> I was about to say something so bad right now. Alhamdulillah, don't say that, don't say it. It's that convert moment where like if I was a convert, I would have said it. Like if I wasn't converted yet, but it's 20 years ago, so I can't say it. 
I'll, I'll talk, talk about it later. It involves a breakfast cereal. So, um, yeah. So the first is knowledge. Let's get back to where we were. And how the end of the Quran talks about really three aspects of culture. Number one is popular culture, like what we just did, I just did all on purpose. We did like this little cultural, contemporary cultural, pop culture thing, and you all were into it. No one was sleeping, even though it has nothing to do with what we're supposed to be here for. That's the power of popular culture. It, it amazes people, it bedazzles people, it captures them. So the most popular thing in the time of the Prophet's companions were camels. Like camels were like a Bugatti. Like camels made you cool. And that's why the Prophet said to Sayyidina Ali, if one person becomes Muslim through you, it's better than a red camel. And what did he mean by red camel? The entire dunya. Khairu laka min humr al ni'am. The hadith says. Better for you than red camels. Red camels are like, what? Right. So in the Quran, Allah says, Wal adiyati dabaha. Al adiyat is an adjective. The Arabs, when, when something is known, so it's so explicit that you don't have to name it, they would just call it by its adjective or its predicate. So you see, for example, Paul Pierce. I'm using this outside of the context of Allah being the truth, but if you were like, yo, the truth is here, people might think like Paul Pierce is here. Right, if you were to say, you know, uh, whatever nicknames are out there for people nowadays, instead of their name, people know who you're talking about because it's known to you. So al adiyat pay attention, this is kind of cool, is equivalent to the truth is to Paul Pierce. Adiyat, when the Arabs heard the word adiyat, those things, yajri ala al-ardi sura, those things that move quickly on the face of the earth. So basically, if you want to translate adiyat, it's like the movers. It's like Bobby Shmurda, the movers, right? It has that feel, the movers. So you know exactly who's saying it and what they're talking about. So when the Arabs heard Al-Adiyat, it's, it's interesting. It's very equivalent to the feeling of like the truth being Paul Pierce. You understand what I'm trying to say? So Allah doesn't say camel. He says Al-Adiyat. He just says Al-Adiyat because it's so known to the Arabs. They are, they're like, oh yeah, I know what that is. That's dope. <laughs> Cultural. If you went on Twitter in the Arabian Peninsula, like, Adiyat would be number one. Because that was what was important to the camel races, right? The second thing are phenomena that have happened historically, like events. Like, we saw what happened today in Cleveland, where a certain segment, black America, is being continually told that your taxes are not being paid to protect you. You're paying taxes so law enforcement can kill you. And someone can sit in a car and shoot people, unarmed people, through the front of their window, and nothing will happen to those people. Enough is enough. And, and I'm going to say this. You can't be concerned about Palestine and not concerned about black America. You can't be concerned about Kashmir and not concerned about not just black America, immigrants coming across the Mexican border, the plight of the white poor in the country. Relax. All of that. Uh, uh, thank you, appreciate it. But you know, subhanAllah, we can move on. <laughs> All of that, you can't do everything about it. You can only do certain things like Palestine, Syria, what's happening to our brothers and sisters in Sham. We have concern for that, but then my sphere of influence is small. I have to focus on that. So the Prophet Sallallahu I did this on purpose. Now all these phenomena I mentioned culturally, why would Allah mention, talk about social justice issues, Why is this baby being killed? Allah takes on a known social phenomena in the Arabian Peninsula, is killing children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions something that the Arab poets talked about before the time of the Prophet in detail. That's the ilaf of the Quraysh, the security of the Quraysh. They used to talk about like, why are they secure? How do they have ilaf? Like they live in the worst valley in the desert. It's hot. There's nothing but ahjar, stones there, this, this, this. So they used to talk about the ilaf of the Quraysh always. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals, li ilafi Quraysh. And the reason that surah starts with lamb, li ila, na, na ilaf Quraishin, li ilafi Quraishin, with the lamb, is because the only way I can really paint this to you it's like if you're at the barber getting like lined up, it's Juma, you want to look good, straight lines for the straight salah, so you rocking it. And you get a little fade, right? And you're looking, you know, holding it down. And 
suddenly, if you were in Mecca in the 5th century or 6th century, and, and they heard, Li ila fi Quraysh, your barber would have been like, yeah, I, mean, I always wondered about that. Like that's why it's, it's worded that way in the Quran, because it, it speaks to the, the, the collective cultural literacy of the Arabs of the Hijaz. It was something that they used to be amazed at. The third aspect of society are spiritual issues. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Hatta tiyakumul bayina, the Prophet. So you see, the end of the Quran uses three inherent characteristics of any society to speak to the Arabs in a way that they understood. Even in their mixtapes, right? The Arabs had mixtapes, they called it poetry. And one of the things that they would do in their mixtapes is talk about their hood and mean, what they're trying to do is talk about their, a person. But instead of mentioning a person, they would mention like aspects of their neighborhood, like Long Beach, LBC, Compton, the CPT, New York, L-O-S-E-R. All of that right there, they, they would do that. Are you okay? They would do that, right, to highlight the person they're talking about. For example, Imr Qais, he was a great rapper before the time of the Prophet ﷺ. He wrote a poem, it was so incredible that it was hung on the Kaaba in gold called the Mu'allaqat. He says, So in this poem, he's talking about his hood, like I'm from here, I'm from Queensbridge, Nas, the whole thing. It's very similar to contemporary hip hop, by the way, because Jahili is Jahiliya. It doesn't change. But he talks about, you know, this village and that village and between this place and that place and this place. So he mentions places, but he's talking about people. Now look, Watini what? Zaytun Waturi Sinin. It's talking about prophets, but it doesn't say Musa, Nuh, Isa, and Muhammad. It says Watini was Zaytun. Tin was Zaytun. Of course, Tin and Zaytun is Sayyidina, uh, Sayyidina Nuh. Waturi Sinin, Sayyidina Musa. Wahath al Balad al Amin is Sayyidina Man. Muhammad So Allah uses the same cultural style of the Arabs to grab them and give them a little swag so the da'wah doesn't put them in a coma, the da'wah attacks, attracts their attention. And that's why we're interested in Lindsay Lohan. And that's why we're interested in Lupe. And that's why we're interested in those people. And you know what? You should be interested in cultural icons except Islam. Because the Prophet prayed for two Umars who were the most popular banging Umars in the hood of Mecca because he knew that if one of them became Muslim, as Caldwell wrote about in The Tipping Point, things would change. An ignorant community will always underestimate the power of cultural icons because it's so insecure that it hates to acknowledge that it needs success. But we need success. I've seen five people become Muslim because of Lupe. Yesterday in Boston, four people became Muslim after Juma. One of them, why? I love that, what's that rapper from Chicago? Fa fiasco? Right, I was like, Lupe Fiasco. So we need cultural icons. So cultural literacy. So in order to make da'wah, to be a reformer, basira means religious literacy and cultural literacy. The second characteristic, Allah says, قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدُعِي لَاللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَ أَنَا وَمَنِ تَبَعَنِي I and those who are with me. The second quality of reform is group work. Is group work. The biggest problem with the New York Knicks is their inability to function as a cohesive group. I mean, look at J.R. Smith now. He looks inspired. Look at the guy with the high top fade from the kid and play era. He looks inspired. However, when they were in New York, they were not playing inspired team basketball. You understand what I'm trying to say? There is this idea of teamwork. And you can't do it alone. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said very beautifully that the lone sheep is the first one to get eaten. And oftentimes you will feel tired of the community, upset with people. I'm going to do this on my own. I'm going to handle this. You know, our scholar said the worst thing you can say repetitively is the word I. Because that's the word shaitan uses, ana khayru minhu. I am better than him. I, 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 I. But we're taught to say, iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'in. We worship you, not I worship you. The ability to work collectively is the sign of our sincerity. The greatness of the Sahaba is that you have incredible individuals who their incredible talents and genius 
is coupled with the fact that they're able to control their egos and work together. You know, if you were to hire Abu Bakr and Omar in the same company, you wouldn't do it. Because you would say, they're both too powerful. They're both too incredible. But the beauty of Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Omar is their ability to humble themselves and work collectively. Now that doesn't mean that they didn't get in fights. I mean, read the tafsir of Surah Hujurat. Abu Bakr and Omar yelled at each other. Sometimes as Muslims like, oh God, we can't have any differences. And you know, people start fighting. We're like, this ummah is destroyed. No, 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 man, fighting is good. No, sometimes fighting and arguing is good if there is a commitment to ethics. Because usually that argument and those differences are rooted in our sincerity to want to see things happen right. But the problem is not fighting or arguing, it's how we fight and how we argue. So group work, collective work. The, the third characteristic which is important is Allah says in the same verse, was subhanallah. This is called i'tiradi, it's a parenthetical sentence. It happens in the middle of the verse, it comes out of nowhere and it kind of smacks you. So Allah says, this is my way, I call upon knowledge. I am those with me. Those are the first two characteristics, right? Wa subhanallah. And glory be to Allah. Why does that come there? My teacher told me, he was a great scholar, he memorized Sahih Sitta, subhanallah, before he was 30. He said to me, that is to remind us that in the incredible demand of work and the pressure of activism, don't forget to praise Allah. Don't forget to say subhanallah. Don't get caught up with your activism to the point that you forget your ethics. We as a community have to have the ethics of justice and activism. We have to have, excuse me, the fire of justice and activism, but also we have to have the fire of ethics. We're both, we're both. When the man in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sahih Bukhari, he was about, he was fighting an enemy and the enemy said, La ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah. He was like, nah, it don't matter, dude, you out. Bam! He hooked him up. Then afterwards he came back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He told him what happened. That's justice authority. He killed the man. The Prophet said, the Sadra. Did you split his heart? Do you know if the Iman in his heart was true or not? So the Prophet marries this idea of working together with ethics. So Subhanallah is the idea of having that moment of dhikr, man, every day. Having those quiet times with Allah at least once a week. Being away from activism sometimes just to make sure the heart is there. Don't leave activism. There has to be a balance between the both, between both of them. But what subhanallah is the third characteristic is spirituality. Rabbaniyya, as mentioned in the Quran. The fourth, وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ mushrikeen. It's the same verse, is what we call tamyiz. Tamyiz, and that means uniqueness. That in my dawah, I don't have to get nasty. In my dawah, I don't forego the ethics that Islam has given me in the name of dawah. When I was in college, right? I some stories, right? This is a brother. He came to me in the masjid and he was like, I was at the club last night making dawah. I said, That's what I said what? Which club is that? I mean, I'm just joking. So that was before I was married. So then I said to him, he said, yeah, I was making dua to this girl named Shireen. And I said, man, how did you? He said, I started dancing. And I figured like, because I didn't touch her and I didn't try to move on her, she'd know I was a Muslim and I was a good dude. I said, look, bro, I think you were being the recipient of the dawah. I don't think you were given. That's not tamiz. That's sacrificing all of our principles and everything, right? For what we stand for. The next few conditions, I only have a few minutes, are found in Surah Al Nahl. So the first verse says knowledge, religion, cultural context. Second is what? Is group work. Third is what? Spirituality, your own spiritual development. Fourth is to be different, not to sell out in your ethics and to give up your principles. The fifth in Surah Al Nahl. Is wisdom. What does wisdom mean? Wisdom means to put things in the right place at the right time with swagger. Let me give an example. When I became Muslim, my best friend became Muslim with me. His name is Leland. We were DJs together. He was DJ Joker. He lives in DC now. He's married to a Moroccan woman, hence, he's extremely happy. 
and he's gotten, mashallah, a little heavier. Some Moroccan food is no joke, mashallah. When we converted, there was a convenience store next to our mosque that was ran by a brother from overseas who sold every possible haram thing you can imagine. We called it Haram Co. This brother sold everything haram. I said, man, subhanAllah, brother, can you, can, is there one thing haram you don't sell? So we decided, we're going to get this brother, man. So what we did is, he knew I was the khatib of the masjid. We wore turbans and thobes. We had the zikr beads and everything. We went into the store. I bought a 24-pack of Bud Light. Leland grabbed all the dirty magazines. It was funny because he was like <laughs> trying to look. And all, all kind of debauchery. We, we filled our basket full of debauchery, right? I called it the basket from Nar Jahannam. This is the basket that will take you to hell. We went up there. He was like, he was like some out of Dave Chappelle, like when to keep it real. And then he looked at me and he was like, Imam Sahib. And I was like, G by Sahib. <laughs> and I was like, Jaldi, Jaldi kya? Like, hurry up. I, I spoke to him in Urdu, right? I said, hurry. Zindigi, bebandigi, sharmindigi. Make it quick. And this brother started shaking. He started shaking. And I said to him, what's wrong, man? And Leland, he had the tesbih. He was like, stop for law, stop for law, stop for law. We got like cigars, you know what I'm saying? Cohibas, number five. And he said to me, I'm just shocked to see you buying this. Leland, he said, and that's how we feel when we see you selling it. He made Toba that night and came back to Allah. That's wisdom. That's swagger. In Cairo once, I had this taxi driver who smoked these cigarettes, Cleopatra's. Man. So my son was with me and I said, Sheikh, I have a problem. My son loves candy. He won't stop eating candy. And he said to me, threw his cigarette out the window. No, he had a cigarette with him. He turned to my son. He said, anything that hurts you, you shouldn't put in your body. Then he said to me, Ahadihi muqaddima ya shaykh. He said, is this like an introduction? I said, yeah, it's an, it's an introduction. He threw the cigarette out the window and he said, thank you, my son, for talking to me this way. He said, all these people with big beards, they come into my car and they just abuse me. And I can't stop smoking. But now, wallahi, I'll try to stop smoking. That's what I mean by wisdom with what? Swagger. The last two, because I'm done. The last two characteristics that we need to have, Allah says, he says, hasana is to speak professionally, to take some courses, how to talk, how to engage people. The language of, you know, New York and bed and Flatbush is not the language of Manhattan. Both of them are important. The language of Oklahoma is not the language of Virginia and Baltimore and so on and so forth. You have to know how to speak to people and be professional. And the last, ahsan means do the research the topic that you're going to speak to or address so you know how to make that reform. May Allah bless all of you. Barakallahu feekum. I apologize about the New York stuff. Assalamu alaikum.